The War Zone has the latest scoop on the U.S. Air Force B-21 Raider. Riffing on Secretary of the Air Force Frank Kendall's recent remarks at the Air and Space Force Association's Air, Space, and Cyber Symposium in National Harbor, Maryland. Secretary Kendall portrayed the newfangled stealth bomber as part of a family of systems that likely includes a retinue of low observable drones, collaborative combat aircraft, and Air Force newspeak, at the very least. Drones accompanying the Raider as part of the family of systems could render solid service by riding shotgun to defend it, or by helping out with such key tactical functions as scouting, counter-scouting, and command and control. Kendall reported, moreover, that the bomber itself is designed to execute missions far beyond simply penetrating hostile airspace, World War II combined bomber offensive style, and dumping large volumes of ordnance on targets assigned to it. For example, it could presumably act as a surveillance, communications, or battle management platform. This is not your granddad's B-17 flying fortress. Commentary on the B-21 remains largely confined to the realm of speculation. After all, the warbird remains shrouded in secrecy and is not yet to take to the blue yonder for the first time to prove its mettle. Still, it's not too soon to start ruminating about its development. How the U.S. Air Force might use it, and what dwellers in the wretched hive of scum and villainy might do to blunt its impact. With regard to development, testing, and production, one hopes the Air Force will proceed with all dispatch, consistent with scrupulous fidelity to the scientific method. An aircraft is a hypothesis, and you can never finally prove a hypothesis. You can only disprove it. The process is easier in the engineering world, where you can transform an idea into metal, predict how the widget will perform, run field trials and see whether the widget lives up to its billing, and approve or improve it or junk it for the next big idea. Builders and aviators should ruthlessly and remorselessly critique the B-21's performance once it starts flying, presumably late this year or early next year. Do not let military can-do culture bypass scientific rigor. Nor should Air Force magnets order the bomber into serial production until the first handful of experimental copies has performed well, withstanding efforts at falsification. Concurrency. Mass producing a plane, ship, or other complex weapon system before it has been fully tested, then retrofitting fixes into the platform as problems turn up, has been tried repeatedly in recent decades. History is frowned on it, as the current Air Force leadership concedes. Let's not skimp on the scientific due diligence this time around. But suppose the Raider does prove out. How will the U.S. Air Force employ it? The possibilities are intriguing. The Air Force covets upwards of 100 copies of the plane. That would dwarf the 20-plane inventory of B-2 Spirits, the B-21's 1990s-era predecessor. Leave aside the Raider's foremost mission, nuclear deterrence. The deterrence is pivotal to U.S. military strategy and hardly needs restating, but think about the possibilities in conventional scenarios. It would be malpractice not to integrate such non-nuclear armaments as the Extended Range Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile, the JASM-ER, and the Long Range Anti-Ship Missile, LRASM, the JASM spin-off, into the B-21. A large force of B-21s armed with precision-guided air-to-surface missiles toting conventional payloads would provide commanders with mass, a crucial ingredient of combat power, in a way the ultra-lean B-2 force never could. Remember, quantity has a quality all its own. Air power is what Admiral J.C. Wiley termed a cumulative mode of warfare waged by conducting numerous tactical actions unrelated to one another in time or in space. Unlike sequential warfare, it doesn't drive toward any particular place on the map or toward a decisive showdown with enemy main forces. Rather, it's a strategy of a thousand cuts, doing modest damage and scattershot engagements all over the place in order to sap the enemy's war-making potential over time. A lot of small losses can add up to something big and debilitating. Naval warfare is chiefly cumulative in nature, and so is air power. While extolling cumulative operations as an adjunct to sequential operations, however, Wiley insists that cumulative operations are never decisive in themselves. They're a difference maker in close-run struggles, but they can be highly effective if you have enough assets. That's the value of mass. Cumulative operations unspool at many places on the map, so they're dispersed in geographic space. But if you can concentrate dispersed actions in time, 
Striking hard, more or less simultaneously, at those places, you can hope to generate wrenching psychological shock among the enemy leadership, the people, and government, while playing havoc with military forces and industries that support them. For lack of a better term, call it the shock and awe effect. Now, map this into the Western Pacific. Squadrons of furtive B-21s, able to operate within China's anti-access zone, could strike at a People's Liberation Army Navy invasion fleet at its moorings, or in transit to whatever the battleground might be. Or they could go after piers, ammunition, or fuel storage, and shipyard infrastructure that supports the fleet. Sink or heavily damage the fleet or cripple its support, and China stands little chance of prevailing in the Taiwan Strait, South China Sea, or elsewhere. Maybe Wiley is correct, and air action wouldn't put an end to the fighting, but it would certainly balk Chinese strategy, confounding Beijing's goals while hastening U.S. and Allied forces toward victory. Air power advocates have long claimed that air power wins wars. Maybe it would in this instance. It would certainly be of the essence. Or if U.S. commanders and political leaders decided on a strategy of forbearance, abjuring strikes along the coast of a nuclear-armed antagonist, they could deploy B-21s more defensively along the first island chain. Bombers could disgorge volleys of JASM ERs and LRASMs to defend the islands against amphibious assault while helping close the straits to Chinese maritime movement. Bottling up the PLA Navy, maritime militia, and merchant fleet within the China Seas would expose Chinese shipping to destruction at Allied commanders' discretion. The U.S. Marine Corps regards Marine forces on Okinawa and elsewhere along the island as America's stand-in force. A contingent that defies Beijing's anti-access efforts, scouts for the U.S. Navy fleet, and dishes out firepower of its own to repel efforts to land troops on the islands or force the straits. The U.S. Air Force's Raider Force could act as a skyward arm of the stand-in force of the fleet, lending its own firepower to deny the PLA access to waters and skies beyond the China Seas. The Air Force has increasingly embraced its role as a sea service, Witness a simulated raid on Russia's Black Sea Fleet in 2020, imagery of non-stealthy U.S. bombers dropping precision minefields and firing LRASMs, an ongoing effort at dispersing airfields and beefing up logistics around the Pacific to augment the force's combat resilience, and on and on. Such endeavors would be all the more lethal once supplemented by masses of stealth bombers able to get close to their targets while evading detection, targeting, and counterfire. If successful, in short, the B-21 will present U.S. and Allied commanders the opportunity to exploit command of the air before winning it. Aerial command generally depends that an air force suppress or destroy enemy air defenses, a laborious and time-consuming chore full of peril. A bomber contingent able to penetrate defended airspace and carry out offensive strikes while hostile air defense remains in the fight would be an invaluable commodity for combat and therefore for conventional deterrence. Now, lest we close on too upbeat a note, the enemy gets a vote in American martial schemes and will doubtless cast it in the negative. PLA strategy is predicated on systems destruction warfare, an approach meant to cut the sinews binding together an enemy system of systems such as the one U.S. Air Force commanders have in mind for the bomber fleet and for the force as a whole. Sever the connective tissue, and the whole thing comes apart into an uncoordinated jumble. If networks using the electromagnetic spectrum are what bind together U.S. forces, imparting cohesion to their efforts, then they'll become a prime target for Chinese systems destruction warfare. Think about the repercussions. If PLA defenders can disrupt friendly use of the spectrum, including within the B-21 Raider family of systems, they'll have isolated each family member degrading U.S. offensive air power and its ability to lash out at Chinese surface forces. And they will have improved their chances of taking down individual units isolated from mutual support from the others. One hopes the U.S. Air Force, and the other armed services for that matter, are being self-critical about the potential weak spot in their force design and tactics, techniques, and procedures, and figuring out how to shore it up. There is no substitute for the scientific method. So from the sea services, Here's wishing our Air Force brethren well. We need you. The opinions expressed in this editorial are those of the author and not necessarily of this presenter.